Well, good evening, everyone. Let's make a start. My name is Phil Dunn, and I'm the EMF representative for Northern Ireland. And I am delighted to welcome you to our webinar this evening. Thank you so much for being with us. That we greatly value your interest and support. And it's our hope that each one of you will feel part of the EMF family. And it's our prayer that you will be informed and inspired and equipped to play your part in mission here at home and across our continent. Now, our topic this evening is not just very interesting, but also incredibly important. It's one that's going to help us defend our faith, strengthen our churches and sharpen our witness. The actual title is this, Proclaiming and Defending the Gospel, the Relationship Between Evangelism and Apologetics. So what is apologetics? And what is evangelism? What are the similarities and differences? What are the key apologetic questions and issues being raised today? And how can we as believers do apologetics well? These are just a few of the crucial questions that we're going to be exploring together this evening. And to help us answer these questions, we've invited three special guests to take part. First up is Daniel Grimwade, who will be chairing the discussion panel. Daniel is the pastor at Dewsbury Evangelical Church, where he's been for the last 12 years or so. He's also the chairman of the EMF Board of Trustees. And he's always had a real interest in the whole area of apologetics. And in fact, way back in the day, he lectured on this topic at EMF School of Biblical Studies. Uh, so we think he's the ideal man to lead the discussion this evening. Our next guest is Dr. Dan Strange. Dan is director of Crosslands Forum, which is a center for cultural engagement and missional innovation. Prior to this, he was college director at Oak Hill College in London and lectured in culture, religion and public theology. He's also a member of Hope Community Church up in Gateshead near Newcastle and is an increasingly popular and trusted author on apologetics. His most recent books being Plugged In, released a couple of years ago, and then Making Faith Magnetic, which was released a little earlier this year. I've actually got a copy sitting here on my desk, and over Christmas I'm going to be digging in and enjoying it. Perhaps uh, Dan will tell us a little bit more about his books uh, in a little while. The third and final guest is Jose Moreno Beracal, known to most of us as Pepe. Uh, Pepe is an EMF missionary in the town of Alcázar de San Juan, which is in La Mancha, central Spain. Now, he's been the, the pastor of the church there since 1991. As part of his preaching and pastoral duties, he has a ministry to prisoners in the local prison, something I think he's going to touch on a little bit later. Uh, he's also a prolific author, having written or contributed to 16 books, all of which have an evangelistic aim in mind, providing many natural openings for the gospel. And prior to the pandemic, he was a regular contributor on Spanish national television, which again served as marvelous opportunities to engage with society from a biblical worldview. So, brothers, thank you so much for agreeing to take part this evening. You are most welcome. You are amongst friends. We are really looking forward to you sharing your knowledge, your experiences, and your passion for sharing the gospel in today's culture. Now, the format for this evening is very simple. After we open in prayer, I'm going to hand straight over to Daniel, and he's going to lead the discussion with Dan and Pepe for around 30 minutes or so. Then we're going to move into a short Q&A session for 10 or 15 minutes. And as ever, we want you to be involved. We want you to engage, ask questions, probe deeper, perhaps even share your own experiences. So take full advantage of the opportunity to engage with them. 
Now, you'll know that by now, the process for asking questions is super easy. Even I can do it, and if I can do it, anyone can. Have a look at the slide coming up here. If you're on a PC, just click on the chat icon, type in your question, and send it off to Martin Tatham. You'll see Martin's name should be near the top of the list. And it's very similar if you're on a tablet or smartphone. The one slight difference being that you need to click on more, then chat, and again, send your question off to Martin. Martin will then collate all the questions and Daniel will put them to Dan and Pepe. So really simple, really straightforward process. But notice you can send your questions to Martin at any time. So please do not wait until the Q&A session. We'd love to have as many questions as possible before then. So get involved and get your questions off to Martin. And I'm sure we'll have a really profitable time. Well, just before I hand straight over to Daniel, we're going to pause now and seek God's help. I'm going to ask Andrew Birch, the EMF director, to open our time in prayer. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Phil. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to begin this uh, webinar this evening by worshipping you as the one true God. And we thank you for the message of the gospel, the good news about how sinners like us can be saved. Thanks to your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. How we thank you for him. And we pray, Lord, that as we think together this evening, about something so important as communicating that good news as faithfully and as effectively as possible to as many people as possible. We pray for the help and the guidance of your spirit. Help our speakers as they discuss this important subject together, but help all of us as we listen in and take part that we may benefit from our time together. We pray that everything we do this evening will be honoring to you and will be helpful to all who will be taking part Lord, bless us, we pray, and may good come from this, even for the progress of the gospel uh, all over Europe and even farther afield. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good evening, everybody. A uh, warm welcome from me. And uh, uh, I'm just facilitating this discussion. So we'll dive straight in. Uh, we've got a series of questions to lead us and guide us through. And uh, obviously, some will, uh, Dan Strange will answer, and some will, Pepe will answer. Obviously, Dan's coming more from a um, theological training place. Uh, Pepe's on the front line. Uh, in terms of his church work. Obviously, they both do a bit of the other as well. So uh, um, anyway, we start with you, Dan. Can you give yeah. us a quick definition of apologetics? Great. Thanks, Daniel. Welcome, everybody. So if I was to define apologetics, I would call it the, the application of biblical truth to unbelief. So the application of biblical truth to unbelief. And if I was going to a particular passage in Scripture, I think I'd go to 1 Peter 3.15, uh, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always pre be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. So the word answer there is a, a defense, a, an apologia, where we get the word apologetics from. Um, and I would notice that it's not simply giving a reason or a, an apology, a defense for the fact that God exists or um, Jesus came back from the dead or miracles are true. Um, all those things which are important. Um, it is a, a giving a reason for hope. And I think that's a, a holistic understanding of apologetics. We're not just brains on sticks. We're giving reasons for hope. And those reasons can be uh, so varied and so um, uh, engaging with our with our hearts and our, our minds and our intellects and our imagination. So that's how I uh, define apologetics uh, in the in a very short span like that. OK, you've already uh, taken us to 1 Peter 3.15, the key uh, text on apologetics. And uh, obviously we could start seeing the, the biblical basis for it. Uh, but why is apologetics so important? Yeah, so I think two, two directions, really. I think maybe we always associate apologetics with uh, um, giving a, a defence or a, a, a reason for the hope that we have in terms of unbelievers people who we want to have uh 
faith in Christ, to come to Christ in faith and repentance. And that's really um, an important aspect of apologetics in terms of our evangelism, presenting people with Jesus Christ. And again, I wouldn't put much difference really between evangelism and apologetics. You could say that apologetics is uh, giving more of a justification for the proclamation of the gospel or how we proclaim the gospel. But our job is to present people to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is so important. Um, also, though, I would say that apologetics has a has a role of strengthening the believer. Um, we still have indwelling sin. There's still unbelief within us. And so apologetics has a, a really important role in building up the, the Christian, um, get, giving them the sense of uh, the, the reason for the hope that we have. So I think it, it, it's um, it's a two directional thing. It is towards unbelief in the unbeliever, but it's also to that um, unbelief in our own hearts. And that is why we want to talk about or give reasons for the hope that we have. OK, great. So uh, turning to you, Pepe, and uh, you're obviously a pastor of a, a local church. That's your primary calling, as it were. And um, so who should be doing apologetics? And can you give some examples? Yes, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to, I'm delighted to be at this uh, webinar uh, discussing these wonderful topics, which I think very important, especially in the, in the days in which we find ourselves. Well, I will say that the, the task of apologetics belongs to everybody, to every Christian. And again, I will refer to you this, to this text in 1 Peter 3.15. It's talking about every day believing, every day behaving of Christians, of all Christians. He says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. And the context obviously has to do with Christianity as we live it day-to-day uh, -day basis. So we need to encourage all believers to realize that we are all for the defense of the gospel, as Paul will also say to the Philippians, that he has been put to the defense of the gospel. And also uh, he's encouraging the Philippians to do likewise, to realize that we are all involved in this work. We shouldn't be afraid and say, well, this is something just for the pastor or for experts or for a professor, or somebody that is, you know, can do this kind of work. Well, Peter is encouraging us all to be involved in this work. How do we go about it? How do we go about encouraging the people? Well. We have to set an, an example ourselves. Uh, if we are keen on evangelism, or if we are keen uh, on apologetics, as uh, it was being mentioned, you know, both things go together. So uh, we set an example to the people around and about us. In my case, I always try in my own preaching uh, to, for the people to realize that uh, we need to be apologetic in our stand and how we present the gospel to the people. So I just illustrate not only in order for people to have like a window in which through which they can see the reality of our world, but also at the same time encourage them to do likewise. And to give you a recent, very recent example, a professor from one of our universities here in Castilla-La Mancha in central Spain uh, was given a lecture in Alcácer de San Juan about happiness and this the interesting thing was about how to measure happiness this is what they're doing now in the university they want to measure happiness so i introduced one of my sons with this topic i said look they are measuring happiness and then i contrasted with what god says in his own word that happiness is defined by god himself not just ourselves thinking what is happiness and also it has a vertical dimension and then a an horizontal dimension. So in this way, we are trying to encourage the people to be engaged in this world, to, to be curious about what is happening in this world, because that's the way to engage with the people with the gospel. You have to have your ears open to what you can uh, listen, uh, to what, what is happening, and then you be able from God's word and from your own behavior, and this is what Peter is also emphasizing there, to give a reason for the hope that is in us. So that leads us nicely on then. So obviously you're working, as you mentioned, in um, central Spain. And um, so what are the kind of key issues that are coming up 
uh, for, for you and the people that you're ministering to and living amongst uh, the key apologetic questions and issues, as it were, that are being raised today? Well, we are living in very exciting times, at least in Spain, and we have these uh, questions about identity. I think this is worldwide, but in Spain particularly it has to do with national identity. Uh, there is uh, this discussion in Spain whether Spain is just one nation or a number of nations uh, within one state. And this is creating opportunities for us to talk about our identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we are also uh, discussing in these days identity as it is uh, found in the Roman Catholic Church. This is very interesting. Sometimes when we find ourselves in secular Europe, we think it's all very secular and going secular. But in Spain, we find that even the right wing parties and the left wing parties are both appealing to the Roman Catholic Church for backing. This is very interesting uh, to, to watch. And so we realize the identity of Spain has much to do still with Roman Catholicism. It's like you go to the Pope and the Pope is gonna give you an authority to speak with a, a very powerful voice to our society. And this is happening, as I said, right wing, and left wing. And of course, we have the, the matter of the gender, the gender agenda that is also very much in our society in, in Spain. And we have uh, these uh, discussions about transgenderism and the, the new laws that are being passed in our society. So there is a polarization in Spain society. And as I said, this is wonderful because we can present that there is a a true identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our identity is not to be found uh, in the fleeting uh, things of this world, but in himself. And we need to explore and we need to, uh, people realize that this is wonderful. Uh, well, they talk about the identity of the country, but we are looking for another country uh, where our true citizenship is to be found. Uh, our identity is to be conformed to what God teaches in his own word. And the other, the other topic, hot topic, that is uh, found in our society now is, of course, with the fake news. And again, I think it's very interesting to realize that uh, because of the pandemic, we are uh, in a wonderful position to um, make the people uh, again uh, realize afresh that Christianity has to do with truth. This is so important in our days, you see, in our days of feelings, and this has to do with the gender, of course, agenda, uh, you know, emotion, fleeting emotions about our countries and our history, our heritage, but Christianity has to do with truth, the truth of God's word, the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctify them in your truth, the Lord said, Thy word is truth. And I think this is very important, not only for the people outside of the church, but even for the church. If you read uh, the work, some of you may have read this, uh, David Wells. He makes such a point, good point, that the church also needs to hear that Christianity has to do with truth. And therefore, we need to come. Uh, and, and to me, people say, look, we're... We're not asking you to be Christian just uh, because it's going to be good for you. Ah, it's going to be good for you, of course. Or this is, you know, something that uh, will benefit you uh, straight away. No, 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 we are not saying that. We are saying that claims of truth. Uh, we have to, as, as Bob Dylan said, uh, realize, make the people realize there are no truths outside of Eden. And where is the truth to be found? Is to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So put the truth in front and take the opportunity. So just uh, let me just follow up that with you. So you've mentioned there like a couple of issues, identity uh, and fake news. So like, and then you said earlier about addressing that in your sermons and equipping people to do it. So does that mean you're going on about fake news and identity every week when you're preaching? Or no. you know, how do how do you intersect the two together? Well, you, you, it depends. Uh, myself, I do expository preaching. So the wonderful thing is that in the expository preaching, you find so many ways in which uh, you can address these issues, these particular issues that comes uh, from the messages themselves. But the, of course, the preaching is not the only format that we have. And then uh, we find ourselves in Bible studies or in other 
just informal conversation. We try to make the people realize these are the hot issues that need to be addressed from the Bible. Mm -hmm. Concerning identity, I was invited recently to take a conference in the north uh, east of Spain in Barcelona, and the topic was gender, uh, the gender agenda. And it was amazing to see so many young people there present to, to hear about these things. So this is something that we should take this opportunity to address these issues and to be able to come uh, with gentleness and respect, of course, this is very important. Uh, Peter mentions that very clearly there, but at the same time with the truth of God's word. Okay, uh, so Dan, Pepe's mentioned a couple of things that are key issues in Spain. What about for those of us here in the UK? What are the key apologetic questions that you sense are being raised and we need to yeah. engage with? Well, I think on the one hand, if we if we are tethered by God's word, if we believe what the Bible says about humans is true, then the encouragement here is that uh, all human beings who are made in the image of God, who are made for God, who are running to him, but running away from him, who know him and don't know him, as Romans 1 says, or Acts 17, there'll always be a point of contact. And I say that because I think if we don't have that, we don't hold on to that. I think we can be very lost because we think people it's not as if people are antagonistic against Christianity. Some are. It's more that um, they, we're just an irrelevance. People have no concept of what we would want to say or bring. And it's that kind of situation. It's the irrelevance of our faith. Now, we need to look at the world through the word. And the Bible does tell us that everyone knows and doesn't know. Everyone is running to God. And when you think about that, we're kind of tethered to the word, but also we can have we can try and get traction with where people are at. And I would say the same issues as, as Pepe in terms of issues of identity, um, issues of um, uh, the standards in society. Where do those standards come from? What happens when we fall? Do we is there any comeback? I mean, that's the cancel culture situation we're in at the moment. One strike and you're out. And where what, what happened to the concept of forgiveness or restoration? deliverance where do we find that um how do we do we think that um there is some are we like puppets do we have freedom i mean these are perennial questions that i still think all human beings ask but they ask them in particular ways at particular times and we need to do the the kind of the excavation you remember paul in athens he walks around the objects of worship um before he says you know you have this unknown god um, and so he tries to then confront and connect with the Lord Jesus. So I think there's some of the key issues. I think one issue, Daniel, is and sociologists of religion talk about this, and this might be slightly different than Pepe's situation, um, about whether especially we're enchanted as a culture or disenchanted. Are we immune to transcendent experiences um, or are we enchanted? And I think many people... They'd like to believe, well, they think they, they believe in that John Lennon song, you know, imagine above us is only sky. But I think often people believe in all kinds of things still. It, they're, di they're differently enchanted than how they were. But as soon as you start digging, you realize that, um, as one writer says, the secular is haunted. And I think for some for people in the UK, it, it's typified by a, a book that was written a few years ago by an atheist called Julian Barnes, a book called Nothing to be Scared of. And he starts the book like this. Um, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. And I think that's a great way of describing how a lot of people are in the UK. I wouldn't call them hardened, thought through ideological atheists. Um, they don't believe, but they, they recognize there is something and they're pushing towards some idea that the world, there is there more to this life? And they're looking for it in all kinds of different ways. And we have to try and discover what, what those ways are, are because we're, we want to tell the story of the gospel, which is the greatest story, which includes all those other fake stories, fake news we've been talking about. That's what idolatry is. Um, so I, I'm optimistic that we can always find a point of contact, but we need to be creative in how we do that, especially in a what we might call a post-Christendom context in the UK. So give us some uh, quick lead-ins as to the best ways of doing that. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I mean, people believe all kinds of things in terms of superstition. Um, people do have standards of, of morality. Where, where did, where did those, those come from? People want to connect to things and to people. They want a sense of significance. Um, and again, I think it's um, by, um, I know 
an LGBTQ rally, going to Comic-Con, supporting a football team, uh, going to a stadium experience, all of these things that we invest our time and our money in, they're, they're there because we're, we're kind of, we, we want some kind of connection. And what we have to do is try and uh, talk about that, di- listen to people, especially to see where, where they're coming from, um, and then think about them theologically to say, wow, they, they are looking for something because we know that they are. I mean, that's what idolatry is. Idolatry has got that it's kind of at the base of any idol is, 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 a, is something God has created, but it's been inflated to be a God and it's not a very good God. And our job is to enter into those into, into people's worlds um, and engage them and try and gently expose that idolatry and then show them that fount of living water, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, which I think is what apologetics is, is all about. But we need to go to where people are because um, in, I may be I may be it might just be me. But people aren't coming up to me every day and saying, you know, Dan, I woke up this morning and I felt under the wrath of God. I felt I need to come to Christ. But they're living religious lives. They're, 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 they're kind of answering their image of godness and their, their, their idolatry all the time. So how do we make those connections in a, in a very natural way? And that's what we have to do. OK, um, you, you've kind of hinted at some of the struggles and difficulties that we're facing as uh, uh, churches you know, in this country and probably the same across across Europe. And, you know, we're seeing some growth, but not significant growth. So is that just down to poor apologetics? Huh. Um, because after all, you're arguing that apologetics can show that Christianity is true and everything else is a lie. So uh, is it just because we're not very good yeah. at doing it? <laughs> well, on, on the one hand, I'd say this, that uh, God is sovereign no one comes to Christ unless they are drawn by the spirit. There's a work of uh, regeneration that needs to go on that God sovereignly directs. I believe that completely. But I also think that the spirit works through means. And I think the Bible gives us uh, models of how to engage unbelief. I think especially in, say, the book of Acts, where I think those those narratives are there to are, are exemplary for us to model um, and the example I, I always give is um, I go and watch a, a football team in um, East London called West Ham United. And whenever the thousands of people stream towards the stadium, there's a brother there. He's got a megaphone and he's shouting out Bible verses. Now, do I think that people could be converted through them listening to those Bible verses? Well, yes, God can do anything in that sense. Do I think that that's the most effective way of doing evangelism and witnessing today? No, I don't. Um, now, I'm, I, I don't think I'm denying the, the spirit's power there. Um, so I do think there are more and less effective means um, without denying that it's only by the spirit that people are, are, are saved. So we're to be faithful in our apologetic. Which apologetic, which way of talking about our faith most glorifies God? And I do think the Bible sets out patterns to do that in more or less effective ways. Um, so I think I'd, I want to answer it in, in those two ways, the sovereignty of the spirit, but also the importance of understanding people. And I think it would it's if we're not listening to where people are coming from, if we're just treating them, if we're treating all people the same, we say it doesn't matter which country they come from, what cultural context, what ethnicity, what gender then that's not loving to people. We, we need to listen to people um, to, to understand them. And I think that's a loving thing to do. And as Christians, we are to love others in that sense. So listening is so important. And then applying the gospel in their specific situations, in their specific contexts. I think that that is a Christian apologetic. Mm, great. So uh, Pepe, tell us some stories from the uh, what's been happening in your church of people who've come to faith in recent years and what have been the key things that God has used and how much has apologetics have played in, in their conversions? Well, uh, how we see apologetics is, is, is part of a whole framework. Uh, we don't just go and do now. We are going to do apologetics, you see, and this is just, uh, you know, the, what we do today, you know, and not, nothing else tomorrow. Or the kind? No, no, no. That's not the approach. It's, it's in within. It's built within a system of giving a reason for the hope that is uh, found in in us. And of course, in our um, Roman Catholic country, as you're well uh, well aware, in, in Central Spain, particularly, we have much to do with Roman Catholic teaching. So therefore, our apologetics has this um, religious dimension, if I can put it like that. Uh, we need to address all the time. 
uh, the question that people, religious people are putting to us in terms of uh, religion. And in that sense, uh, we need all the time to be afresh of what is happening within Roman Catholicism, the practices, the traditional practices of Roman Catholic Church, but also what is happening, the changes that has occurred and have confused the picture for so many even evangelicals uh, since Vatican II. So we need to realize what is happening and the new attitude that you find, for instance, in, in the recent Pope and how he approaches things. And this is he giving, he giving us uh, an opportunity to present the gospel in this context of Roman Catholicism. And uh, we, we rejoice that we, we've, we've seen conversions all throughout the years from people from Roman Catholic backgrounds. And recently there was a, a lady that was converted, very staunch Roman Catholic background and a wonderful work of God in in her life and uh, all the time uh, thirst for God's word is like um, they're rediscovering uh, a secret that was there, uh, a treasure that was there in God's word for her. And uh, this, uh, this lady is really uh, realizing the greatness of God's word. And we need to, all the time when we evangelize uh, Roman Catholics, uh, to make them realize that uh, Christianity comes from the Bible. And there is such a wonderful world to discover in the Bible. And they can go for themselves to God's word and they can realize how great our Lord Jesus Christ is. So that would be a main thing. But of course, we've seen people uh, also find it uh, that uh, in illnesses, terminal illnesses or illnesses that could be fatal for them, uh, looking for some help, uh, looking for some meaning to life. And this uh, also the Lord has used this uh, so that we could talk to them or invite them to hear God's word. And that has been uh, very good uh, for them as well. We've seen cases of that. But I also want to make another point concerning this. And this is that um, we need, uh, as, as Dan was uh, also saying, that we need God to shine upon the evidences. Uh, it's not enough just to do apologetics, uh, evangelism. There is a work of God that needs to be done by God himself. And he is the only one who can do it. And I mentioned this also because uh, sometimes, and this is important for us to realize, that we present the evidences to the people and the people don't come to faith and repentance in uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we have some examples uh, talking with, with people and, uh, and the people say, yes, I can see what you are saying, but uh, I'm not going. Uh, to follow that way at all. Uh, so we realize there is a stubbornness, there is a, a heart that needs to be changed by God's, the Holy Spirit. So if I can put it in another way, uh, we need to realize that we are, uh, you know, uh, here for people to be saved, but also uh, the people uh, that they will have an evidence uh, that uh, they will have to stand before God and say, you, you had the evidence of myself, and, and you, uh, deep in the bottom of your heart, you realize that uh, what is happening to you. So in a sense, uh, this is a very solemn task that is entrusted not only to ministers of the gospel, uh, but to every Christian. We realize that we stand before God, we stand before souls of uh, people, and they will have to give an account. That's why we have to present the gospel as it is, because they will have to give an account of themselves to God. Um, okay, and how do you go about then uh, equipping people in your church to for evangelism, and, you know, with apologetics and so forth, and to be engaging um, in in this vital work? Well, as was mentioned at the beginning, I've been thirty years uh, in this wonderful privilege uh, privilege of preaching God's word here in Alcázar de San Juan. So, throughout my long ministry, we have used all sorts of ways uh, to teach people apologetics. We have had Bible studies on apologetics so that people can be equipped to that end. Uh, we have tried to make them realize the riches of God's word in that respect as well. That we present is reasoned defense of the Christian faith. But as I mentioned earlier, this is all built into the system. And uh, so if I can put it like this, what we are now encouraging the people is to realize that all subjects and the, what is in the minds and the hearts of the people at the present time, what concerns them, we can bring from there the gospel to their lives. And for instance, uh, there is another law that has been passed in, in Spain about uh, euthanasia, 
and we are now doing a, in a mid-quick Bible study, we are doing euthanasia. And I, I try to remind the people this is so, so relevant. Uh, other subjects like suicide, uh, uh, a very famous actress has just committed suicide in Spain just today. And it's a very re relevant subject and how you bring hope to people when they are considering uh, this matter of suicide and, and how you, you, you address these, these things. And I was, I was bringing to them the, the, the example of the Lord Jesus Christ because they say, well, euthanasia, because there is, uh, there is no dignity in somebody that is uh, facing this uh, terminal illness. And I said, well, consider the Lord Jesus Christ himself, how he went to death, how he suffered so much and mm. his dignity was there to be found when he was willing to go to the cross and not affected at all by what by his terrific sufferings uh, uh, was, uh, you know taken to to the cross so we we need to realize uh, to, to, to bring the lord jesus christ into the picture if i can put it like that it's not just talking about subjects you see absolutely say, look uh, the, the lord jesus christ we, we bring the, the lord jesus christ to the people and, and make them realize that the lord jesus christ is really what is there and there is hope even in, in terrible circumstances. So all the time, trying, trying, trying to so that we are not the only ones who isn't doing this work, but it's the church it needs to be aware of the, where they find themselves. And the other example, and it was hinted at by Phil in the introduction, is the great encouragement I'm having now at the prison. Uh, I've been also doing this ministry in the prison here in Alcázar San Juan for so many years. But uh, of, of late, I'm, I'm having great encouragement. And this has to do in, in part from the fact that uh, I am expounding Ecclesiastic, the book of Ecclesiastes to them. And I don't know who is enjoying most of <laughs> this, uh, whether it is them or myself. I, I am, <laughs> to tell you the truth, uh, and just enjoy myself so much going through Ecclesiastes again. I've done it in, in the church, in the preaching in the church on Sundays, doing it now with, with the prisoners. And they, they're riveting. You can see how, how they are looking for, forward to, to hearing about this wonderful work of God. And so we need to recover the confidence that God's word is relevant to the situation. For instance, I was talking the other week about uh, chapter seven. It says, well, this is better than this, this is better than the other. And I said, well, uh, you know, uh, there are good, uh, better things in this life than others. Sometimes it's difficult to find what is best, <laughs> what is better than other things, but it's the best thing. So this is a, um, just a summary of my sermon. And, and you can see the people uh, saying, well, the Bible has something to do for us here, right and now, but also is presenting us a, a wisdom that will serve us for this life and life to come. Mm, thank you. So uh, I know some questions have started to come in. I've just got one more for each of them before we open it up to uh, audience questions. So, um, Dan, you've written a couple of books. Uh, I think they got a mention earlier, but we're just going to put them up on the screen and give you an opportunity just to say what they're about and why people should read them. <laughs> yeah, so uh, two books I've written in the last few years. They're, they're basically teaching that I've been doing at Oak Hill that I wanted to make more uh, available to the wider church. So the first was called Plugged In, and it's really a rationale as to why we should engage culture, what how culture works, a biblical overview of culture, um, and then giving some um, a, a examples of what cultural engagement looks like. And I think the highlight of that book is a, is a model for cultural engagement that I call subversive fulfillment, which is this idea that the gospel always confronts and the gospel always connects. In, in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says that the cross, we preach Christ crucified. It's the, it, it's the opposite. It's the radical um, kind of uh, no to the world's ways of doing things. It, it, what we think is wise, God thinks is foolish and vice versa. But then Paul still highlights two ethnic groups, Jews and Greeks. They are looking for different things. Jews look for power. Greeks look for wisdom. And then at the end of that passage, Paul says Christ is wisdom and Christ is power in precisely the opposite way that Jews and Greeks think. But he still makes the connections. And so I'm encouraging people to say, you know, Jews look for Greeks. Uh, Jews look for uh, wisdom, um, uh, uh, power. Greeks look for wisdom. What does our 21st century secular person look for? And how does the gospel both confront and connect? And then following on from that, 
uh, is this book, Making Faith Magnetic. And this is, uh, um, EMF people might be interested in this. This is based on the work of a Dutch missiologist in the 1940s and 50s called J.H. Bavink. He was the nephew of Herman Bavink, the kind of famous reformed theologian. But um, J.H. Bavink was a missionary in Indonesia, then Java. Um, and he's a wonderful writer. And he had this um, idea called a, the magnetic point. He says all human beings ask the same questions, the same five questions. Um, how do we connect? Um, how do we live? Uh, how are we delivered? How do we, how, are we in control? Is there a higher power? And what I do in this book is to take Bavink's framework and kind of give it a kind of 21st century twist in terms of explaining it, but also giving very practical examples in our in our culture, in the contemporary culture, as to how people um, are scratching these itches, I suppose, and then showing how Jesus is the subversive fulfillment of these desires that people have. Um, and so uh, that's a, that's a very practical book, giving that framework that I hope will be helpful for churches to contextualize the gospel in their area, for pastors as they preach. This, I think, is a helpful preaching framework. So, yeah, that's called Making Faith Magnetic, um, five hidden themes our culture can't stop talking about and how to connect them to Christ. And uh, I, uh, yeah, I commend both books to you. Thank you. OK, uh, uh, Pepe, so obviously this work that we've been talking about is is sometimes is hard and difficult although your enthusiasm has come across already this evening so what motivates you just to keep going at it uh um for the 30 years you've had there and however many more the lord gives you well before i answer your your question just to say uh, as for those who are connecting from spain that uh uh, Facebook, uh, Dan mentioned, is, is going to appear in, in Spanish uh, next week. I was talking to the editor and it's, it's, it's coming along uh, next week. And the other one has just been accepted also for publication in Spanish. So you can also read it in, in Spanish. And it's very interesting he mentioned this man, Babink, because we have a book of his in Spanish, which is very interesting for those who are coming from Spain, La Fe y sus dificultades, Faith yes, and his own difficulties. So this is going, this has been in the Spanish market for years. And it's one of those books that I enjoy going back again and again to read it because it's such an insight that gives you into personality and how you approach the, the world in which we find ourselves and these difficulties that uh, we all experience and Dan was mentioning that at the beginning. So this is wonderful that we can have this also in the Spanish language. Uh, concerning the, the questions that um, Daniel was, was asking, well, what motivates me is that uh, there is uh, so much evidences for the faith in the Bible so much we can say to the people in order so that they can believe with uh, under the power of the Holy Spirit that this is really something that motivates me to present uh, the case of Christianity as it is to be found in the Bible and we always need to be working on that all the time we need to realize that the challenge is that we are able to present this case as it should be. And as we have been hearing all this evening, uh, we need to realize that um, Christianity has an appeal from God's word to all personality. It has an appeal to the mind, it has an appeal to the imagination, it has an appeal to uh, feelings, it has an appeal uh, to actions. So we need to realize there is something for the understanding, there is something, for instance, in the parabolic teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ for your own imagination. We are taken by these wonderful uh, parables of the Lord Jesus Christ to imagine these settings and to see issues so clearly with this kind of, of teaching or how we experience God. Uh, you see, we in this postmodern world, we, we emphasize the truth, of course, but we need to also say at the same time there is a, an experimental uh, experience, if I can put it like that, of God himself. And we need to, to say that to the people. There is, uh, there is nothing like knowing God himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, this kind of living that uh, Christianity presents is, is uh, wonderful how Christianity is not just something that you also believe, uh, but you, you, you practice Christianity. Oh, Amen. This is so attractive and this is so wonderful. Uh, we need to realize that by practicing Christianity, by acting Christianity, we are a witness to the world. So we, we bring this, we bring this uh, to the people and this is the encouragement that we have the resources there in God's word. And the other thing, and of course has been mentioned earlier, 
uh, already the Lord has promised to shine upon the preaching of Jesus Christ and him crucified with all these evidence around him so that people will come to faith in himself. So we need to have confidence that the Lord will be exalted, that the Holy Spirit will bring people to conviction. Uh, as Paul says, writing to the Corinthians, that the Holy Spirit will work in their consciences. We always need to realize that we are living, we are preaching in front of God uh, to the consciences of men. Great, thank you. Um, so um, we have five questions from the audience so far. Um, and so um, Martin is going to uh, read them out and then I'll direct them as to whether Dan or Pepe should uh, have first dibs at them. Um, so uh, and if we there, there is a so we've got a few minutes for this now and then there's a, uh, a roll on session if you want to stay on later. So if we don't get to your question right now, then there is a chance after half past eight to stay on for a bit in less formal way of chatting about this. OK, Martin. Yeah, please don't exclude yourself, Daniel. You, you're allowed to answer as, as well. Um, so maybe the first one, we've got a good spectrum of, of questions, by the way. Um, maybe I can put one about just the biblical basis. Um, Malcolm McGregor, uh, many of you know, um, asked, uh, uh, much has been written on the relevance of Acts chapter 17. I think, uh, Darren, I think what it was who referenced that. In, in present day apologetics and evangelism, which other New Testament texts specifically apply to our cultural context? Well, you can both have a go at this one, Dan, you want to start? Yeah, so I'm very, yes, yeah, so I, I want to make a distinction between, I think there are some kind of classic exemplary passages, especially in Acts. So I think Acts does have a, have a special role in the canon, but it's more than just one passage. It's a whole load of biblical themes. So, I mean, I'd be as I tried to, you know, drawing out from Romans one, what we learn about human beings, they know and they don't know God at the same time. Uh, the one Corinthians one, we've just been talking about that model of subversive fulfillment. So I suppose you could call it a an anthropology, a, the, 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 the study of the theological study of human beings um, gives us the basis for what I've been talking about tonight in terms of apologetics, as well as that the kind of proof text you could go to, whether it's Acts 17 or 1 Peter 3 or any of any of these passages. I think that the other thing that and it is I really in echo what Pepe said that we can't we mustn't think of evangelism and apologetics as a kind of a um a thing that we're gonna we that we do in that I'm gonna, you know, I'm today I'm gonna do my apologetics and evangelism. We are disciples of Christ, we are followers of him as we fall more in love with him, as we get to know him more. So naturally we, we are more evangelistic and, and apologetic. Yes, we are to give a reason for the hope. We're to prepare ourselves. Um, but this is about discipleship. And as we are, as we are dis followers of Christ. So I think we, then we would be praying for more opportunities to talk about our, our faith rather than seeing it as evangelism and act, uh, as apologetics as an activity that if I do my five minutes a week, you know, I'm going to be OK. It's a it's a whole life thing, um, which I think is much more organic. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd be wanting to emphasize that. And of course, you know, the New Testament is all about how are we disciples of Christ? Yes. Any particulars that are from Scripture that you think should be thrown into the mix here? Well, yes, I agree entirely, of course, with that, that uh, it's not just one passage, but uh, the whole framework of what we are of in, in the Bible. For instance, we go to the Old Testament and uh, we, we see this reality of idol, God and the idols. Uh, yes. we, we all have our idols. We, again, uh, <laughs> Dylan, no, you, you're going to have to serve somebody. We, yeah. we really serve somebody. And, and there's a wonderful approach from idol worship in our, in our society. But I also highlight uh, concerning something, some of the things that also Dan was mentioning, the relevance that we have in Acts 14. Acts 14, when uh, Paul is, is talking to these uh, pagans there and says, uh, and he, he's saying to them, well, you, you look at a creation of what is happening, the good things that we interact with the people, right? because the people are not as Dan was mentioning, just uh, cut off entirely from everything, you know, no, yeah. there is something in there and we need to be appealing to that. Yeah. And also, as I'm doing that uh, preaching now, they say I'm doing acts of the apostles actually now in the Sunday evenings. This is again enjoying so much uh, Acts 19. 
Acts 19, uh, yeah. Ephesus. Uh, we, we see this is this is a technological time in which we find ourselves and, you know, wonderful discoveries and so on and so forth. But the people worship um, uh, the occult. Yeah, so yeah. A lot of things have to do with the occult. I mean, and, and, can I, and, and can I just chip in yeah. there? Pepe mentioned, I mean, I think the, the important thing, of course, the New Testament is built on the Old Testament. And I found like the, the those passages in Isaiah 40 to 55 about idolatry are really helpful. You know, there's some really satirical passages there that are really important in our apologetics. You know, the idea that the idolater uses the um, makes his dinner or supper and then he uses the wood to worship. And Isaiah says, this is ridiculous. And he says, you know, no one stops to think. Um, and, and, and then I would the other final thing I'd say on this is, I mean, going back to Genesis one, there's some great work being done. One writer, Christopher Watkin, who wrote a great book called Thinking Through Creation a few years ago, which is about the patterns that are laid down in Genesis and how they are naturally an apologetic, you know, because the world tells us, for example, you can only have functional beauty or you can only have personal structures or impersonal structures. And Genesis 1 cuts through that with a whole different way of answering key questions that we're asking in our society at a very deep level. So the whole Bible, the way that the patterns that the Bible sets out about reality is a natural apologetic to engage people when we're kind of when the world is scratching its head about how do we answer some of these questions? You know, how, how are we both significant and insignificant at the same time? And the image of God, we say the image of God answers that question. We are insignificant because we are only images of God, but we're so significant because we're images of God. And philosophers have been spending thousands of years trying to work out are we special or not? And the Bible says in the image of God, we answer that question. We're yes, we're special, but compared to God, we're not God. So it's that that example where theology really does help us in answering some of the key questions that humans have today. And that's throughout the whole of scripture. Sorry, that was yeah. a long answer. Thanks, Martin. Hey, OK, we'll do we'll do one more right. and then we'll save the rest for the breakout group after half eight. So you'll have to stay on for that. So, Martin, give us one more. Yeah, maybe I could combine uh, two questions together on, on a similar theme. Um, Celia Ford um, asks, should Christians engage with popular culture? And maybe I could just extend that to say, uh, to what degree do we need to understand non-Christian philosophies or arguments in order to defend Christianity? Is that reasonable to put those two together? Yeah. Who wants yeah. To yeah. Well, I mean, so on, on, on the popular culture one, I mean, for me, I don't think there's any mis mystery. Popular culture is culture that awides, for me, is that uh, appeals to a wide section of society. And because of God's common grace, because of the doctrine of creation, yes, um, all culture has been distorted and twisted by sin. But we need to be, we, we have to be in, engaging uh, uh, in that way. And that we need to, obviously, we need to be careful of not putting a stumbling block in other Christians' way. We need to be careful of, our own sanctification and holiness but i think we should be engaging all the time we should be going out we should be um understanding yeah where people are coming from what makes them tick where are these um itch uh, itches that we you know that, that that they're trying to scratch and i so i'm i'm passionate about our engagement in culture um recognizing that we are called to be a a holy people um, and I think that, you know, they're, they're, these are some of the of the perennial issues in terms of what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. Um, but I don't think we can uh, kind of in, in the plugged in. I talk about how churches can either look in. They just look in towards themselves and wait for Jesus to come again. and They don't engage at all or they lash out or they just look like the world. We're called to be different, but we are called to engage. And uh, I think we need to do that. Yes, uh, I, I agree with what Dan is saying, but uh, to, to try to answer from another angle, this, uh, these two questions that have been put together, it's, it's very interesting to realize what we are saying all of the time. And we need to be to realize uh, on one hand that the God has given, hasn't left himself without testimony, it says in Acts 14, uh, uh, 17, and has given us so many avenues to go to him. So it's not like a straight jacket. Oh, now it's time for us to be all involved in popular culture to be able to bring the gospel. No, your own gifts, your own position in society will give you another opportunity, another avenues of testimony. Maybe you are a farmer 
and you can illustrate the gospel uh, through what you see there in, in, in the crops. Uh, maybe you work in, 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 a, in an office and, and, and the way you do things there uh, will give you another opportunity. So not everything has to rely on this popular culture. You, you need to explore for yourselves how you can in your day-to-day -day life uh, see ways of engaging with people around and about you. So we all have different callings, different interests. And as Dan said, uh, we, we, we pursue a sanctification and we realize that we do it in our own callings. And in those callings, we are called upon to realize how we can present a testimony for the gospel. Yeah, brilliant. Great, thank you. So uh, I'm going to hand back to Phil now. Uh, so this is a, like a little interregnum where there'll be some uh, news and notices about EMF. And this is also if you've had enough, you'll get a get out cause in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, if you're enjoying the discussion, then you can carry on for uh, the next bit and we'll run on till uh, just before nine o'clock. So Phil, um, over to you. Thank you so much, chaps. That was really helpful. I found that really stimulating, uh, really enlightening as well. And of course, thanks to all of you who were asking lots of questions. We didn't get through quite as many as we wanted to, but as we, as you've heard, uh, stay on for a little bit uh, and you'll get your questions answered uh, before the end of the evening. Now, before we finish this part of our webinar, we've got a number of important announcements to make. And the first one concerns our brilliant Christmas project called Happy Christmas, Alunecker. And to find out more, we're going to watch this very short video about it now. Hello. Hi, dear sisters and brothers. Um, greetings from Almuñeca, the sunny Almuñeca. Uh, even though the weather is very nice here, we are getting closer to Christmas. And we want to take this opportunity to take the gospel to the homes of Almuñeca. Together with the mission, we designed a project which consists in distributing 2,000 Christmas greetings with a clear evangelistic message uh, also with the ultimate questions, the booklet by, by Blanchard, uh, John Blanchard. We think that it's a great idea and we are very excited uh, to bring the good news, the gospel, to the 2,000 homes and 2,000 families in Al Muñeca. So thank you very much for your support and prayers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please pray for this project. Thanks. Okay, so just to recap then, Manuel and Alba and the church in Almunecker, they need your help. The goal is to send a copy of John Blanchard's Ultimate Questions in Spanish, along with a gospel greeting from the church, to at least 2,000 homes in the town. Uh, the total cost is around £5,000, and to date we have raised £4,100, which is wonderful. And a sincere thank you to all those who have donated already. We really do appreciate that. But of course, we haven't quite reached our target yet. And there's still a need and there's still time to give. So visit our website at europeanmission.org or forward any donations to the team at our headquarters or to myself. And I should say that if we surpass our target, then any additional money will be sent to the church in Almunecker. So be assured, we won't waste a penny. So that's the Christmas project, but we've also got a whole variety of exciting events coming up over the next few months. The first of these is our next webinar. It's scheduled for Monday evening, the 7th of February, again at half past seven UK time. And this is one you definitely don't want to miss. Why? Because in it, uh, Andrew Birch, our director, will be unveiling EMF's expanded vision for Europe. This, friends, is so significant and it is super exciting. So what's this expanded vision all about? Well, as we know, Europe is the spiritually neediest continent in the world, with relatively few evangelical Christians and gospel churches and a lot of godless religion and godless secularism. The Balkans and the Nordics are two especially needy uh, regions. 
Europe desperately needs more gospel workers and a renewed vision for the planting of new gospel churches. EMF is therefore committed to expanding its support of gospel work in Europe, and we are inviting Christians and churches, people like you, to join us. Now, that's just a little taster. We've got loads more to share, so make sure you don't miss out on our next webinar. But following that event, we've got no less than three conferences lined up for you. The first two of these are here in Northern Ireland. Uh, we've got our Armagh conference taking place on Saturday the 12th of February in Rich Hill Presbyterian Church from 10 in the morning to half past one. The speakers are Manuel Franco, who we've just heard from in the video, Andrew Birch, and the Reverend John T. Graham, the Associate Minister of Hill Street Presbyterian in Lurgan. And our theme is a great one, side by side in the gospel. And we'll be considering the benefits and the blessings of working together for the gospel. The next Northern Ireland Conference takes place just over a little month later uh, in Balamunley. The venue is my home church, Balamunley Baptist, and the date is Saturday the 26th of March, again from 10 to 1.30. And the speakers on this occasion will be Krzysztof Rudkowski from Poland, a second missionary who is still to be confirmed, and Pastor Johnny McLaughlin from Hamilton Road Baptist Church. The theme for this one is another brilliant one, Small Church, Big Mission. We'll be exploring how our local congregations, which are frankly often pretty small, rather ordinary and under-resourced, can play a meaningful role in the great global advance of the gospel. If you're near either of these places, or if you know anyone who lives nearby, please do let them know. And last, but by no means least, is our next GB conference. And this one is really special. Why? Because it's a new conference jointly hosted with the Gospel Coalition Europe. The date is Saturday the 14th of May and it's being held in Trinity Baptist Church, Gloucester. And the main speakers, you can see them there, Tim Savage, TGC founding member, Mike Evans, director of TGC in France. And the missionaries taking part, Manuel Franco, he's a busy man, Rogerio Ramos and Velodia Kostichin. So keep an eye out for that one too. Well, there are lots of dates there for your diary, plenty to look forward to. As ever, all of the information will be on our website at europeanmission.org, on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, and via email in due course. Now, we've also produced a whole range of resources which we would love to share with you uh, to help you learn more about our work and the great gospel needs and opportunities in Europe. So why not ask to receive our vision magazine and newsletter? Uh, the newsletter comes out each month. The vision magazine is released three times per year. And incidentally, the next vision magazine is being released around the end of January and it's going to be brilliant. So make sure you are signed up. In addition, you can also receive specific missionary prayer letters, which will enable you to be better informed, to be more prayerful, and a further great way you can partner with us is by inviting us to take part in your church midweek meeting or Sunday service. We would be thrilled to come and visit and share with you in person. Or if, however, you prefer an online meeting, we'd be more than happy to join that way too. We want to serve you in whatever way we can. To get in touch, just email us or simply visit our website. Again, europeanmission.org. Well then, if you need to leave, you can do so in just a moment. But just like in our previous webinars, as you've heard, we do have an additional session, which will last for around 30 minutes or so. Further opportunity to interact with Dan and Pepe and also to spend a short time in prayer together. We would love you to join that. And I'll explain how in a moment. But for now, let me draw this part of our meeting to a close. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for what we've heard this evening. 
Thank you for the great privilege that it is to be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus. We pray, Father, that you would give us um, that grace, that help, that knowledge, and that passion to share our faith uh, more intelligently, more winsomely, more ably with our friends and our families and our loved ones. Father, we acknowledge that we need your help and your power, and so we pray that you would be pleased to save. Do something marvellous in our families, even this Christmas. Do something marvellous in our continent, we pray. So, Father, thank you for this short time, and we pray for those who will have to depart now, that you would part them with your blessing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you must leave, then thank you again for joining us. We hope you've been blessed and encouraged, and we hope you'll join us next time. And if we don't see you before then, let me, on behalf of EMF, wish you a very happy Christmas. Please feel free simply to disconnect. But if you would like to stay on for that additional session, then simply stay where you are. And as soon as those who are leaving have left, Daniel will get us off and going again. Thank you. Great. Well, um, we'll open it up for anyone to chip in in a minute, but uh, we've got still some questions that had already been posed that we didn't get to. So, um, Martin, do you want to uh, tell us what the next one is, please? You're muted. Thank you, Daniel. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, we've got an interesting one from Diego Lopez. I don't know whether Diego's on the call. Uh, still, welcome, Diego. Diego is one of our missionaries who's just been welcomed into EMF in, in Portugal. But Diego asks, has the pandemic brought about di uh, different discussions? Do you feel there's, there's a shift in conversations in the European context, even regarding the relevance of the church for believers themselves? Pepe? Yes. Yeah, I think the pandemic has brought uh, quite a, a number of issues um, to the front. Uh, so many things that we can uh, discuss and certainly we have found uh, new ways of reaching the people through these uh, ways, uh, the webinars and, you know, through the web uh, and also how we interact with them in so many, so many other ways. But I, I will still say that uh, I think one of the main hot topics has to do with the fact of truth. Uh, how do we measure truth in this uncertain world? How do we find some reality uh, in which we can trust? And I think we, we need to, to measure on, on that uh, reality. At the same time, I think concerning this topic, I, I think it's very important uh, as we communicate that we emphasize the fragility that the people are already feeling yeah, the, the uncertainty of the times in which we, we find ourselves. And this is for us to make sure that people are aware of, of what is, is happening. We are all the time trying to get back to normality. And we, we find all the time that we are frustrated, that we cannot really do everything we wanted to do back again. So what is God telling us about, about this in, in the midst of these uh, circumstances? So I think we need to, to be able to, if I can put it like this, to try to un, uh, make the people understand um, what is happening from God's word, um, uh, what they are feeling, how they are seeing things, but how do we interpret that from God's word? And I think that's our, our calling at the present time. I've just given you two, two examples. Dan, do you want to add anything? No, I mean, in some ways, I, I, in some ways, I want to say that nothing changes. Um, and um, I think the church, the Christian's response to pandemics and these kinds of issues throughout its history would show that, you know, the, 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 the same things that we need to be doing or the same truths about humanity. I think Pepe is right. It does shine a light on on issues and kind of stirs stirs things up, stirs stirs the pot up. Um, and I yeah, I think um, it's actually interesting. I mean, given the, the role that I have, in, uh, I've been teaching in this, in this issue of public theology and the, the Christian's engagement in, in, in society. I think for lots of Christians, it has raised questions that, um, some of us have wanted to put on the table for a long time. What is the relationship between 
the individual Christian and society and the state and government? How are we to react to that? Um, uh, um, wh where are where is what does legitimate um, kind of um, authority look like? Um, who do we listen to? Who do we trust? Again, that, back to Pepe's point about the fake news. So I think there's lots of great opportunities. Um, I think, yeah, it, what's interesting is that I think as much as a showing about the fragility of life in terms of death, I think it has shown about the idolatry of life in terms of, you know, the quality versus quantity and all these kinds of great issues that I think we can use apologetically. Um, but I, 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 I'd caution against a kind of a, uh, like getting not overexcited, but, you know, to say that, you know, things are much better now um, than they were or much worse. It, it, it's not like that. There, there are some great opportunities, but I think there are other ways in which, you know, um, I, 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 I think it's shown to it's shown to me anyway, the importance that we are physical beings, embodied beings. And, you know, I would much rather be with you in person than, than on, on Zoom. But there are affordances for this um method of technology but then we have to realize um how how that works so all kinds of different stirrings of the pot um and we need to just take the opportunities that god has given us at this particular time yeah i will i will add that i, I remember being in a, in a zoom meeting with um, evangelical leaders here in in spain and then uh, one of them has the audacity to say that uh, the pandemic right at the beginning was going to have a great evangelistic effect on the society. And of course, sadly to say, sadly to say, we have not seen that thing happening at all. Uh, we have not seen a turning, uh, as far as I know, in any uh, Western society to, to God in, in large numbers because of the Zoom meetings or anything like that. So we always need to, to be, you know, as, as Dan was saying, that we need to realize that the Lord is doing his work and some some places uh, there's been growth in the churches, some places uh, there has been a loss of people to the to the churches, and some places has been a, a mixture of both experiences. So we need to realize that the Lord is, is doing his, his, his work all of the time and uh, he has a way. And uh, uh, again, we, we need to, to seize the, the opportunity, to see the door of opportunity, whatever happens. Yeah. There's a great essay by... Um... C.S. Lewis called Learning in Wartime, where, which I think is really worth us reading as Christians. It, it, it was given at the start of the outbreak of the Second World War, where he's talking to Oxford students first years. And he said, why would you want to study anything when there's a war going on? And it's the whole thing about, you know, the importance of still um, filling and subduing the earth, the cultural mandate, it, recognizing, though, the importance of evangelism as well. And I think that's a great kind of, um, again, another war slogan in terms of you know keep calm and carry on that's what we have to do as, as christians and use the opportunities where we have them but not yet yeah, just realize that the same the, the things that pepe and i've been outlining about the nature of, of humanity i don't think the pandemic fundamentally changes um that we're made in the image of god that we've suppressed the truth that we worship idols that we need to come to christ those things are there we just have to be creative in 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 how we're drawing on the situations that we're in at the moment Right, thank you, Martin. Next question. Yeah, just a quick, just a quick one, just a, a factual one. Um, Dan, you mentioned um, um, the uh, a book, Thinking Through Creation. Could you just repeat the author's name, please? Yeah, so uh, Christopher Watkin, W A T K I N. He's a he's a Brit. He's a Brit, but he lectures in French philosophy at in Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> um, but it's a brilliant book. I, I'd call I'd call it a biblical social theory. So it's saying what are the patterns the bible sets out that helps us understand the culture that we're in in a really innovative way um it was published by presbyterian and reform publishing in 2017 and um watkins written a, a number of, of other very helpful books on some more contemporary thinkers like michel foucault and uh, jacques derrida very helpful uh, in in our understanding so i'd recommend his writings to you christopher watkin thanks dan and a couple of more practical ones, um, and just suggestions about how to answer particular issues. Maybe I can combine two questions together. One from Chris Jones. People seem to have rejected organized religion today. Mm. How do we overcome this? And, and then Chris adds, people like, can like Jesus, his life is teaching, but they don't want the church. How do you answer that? And maybe I can just add in um, one from Michael Robinson. 
um, on along similar lines. In practice, a lot of people profess to believe that this, this life is all there is, an emphasis on the visible, the immediate, the tangible. It's not always easy to get them to think beyond that. How, how do you experience this challenge and how would you answer that? Yeah, um, well, I mean, so I, quickly, I, I think there's a very interesting survey that was done um, in a British university looking at unbelief, unbelief in five continents and um, inclu including Europe. And it did point out that actually lots of unbelievers still think that there is meaning and purpose. And uh, so I find that very interesting that we don't necessarily just think we're this random collection of atoms with no meaning. And I think that does, again, touch on this idea that however much we we think, you know, however much we hear about, you know, the the new atheism, which is now quite an old atheism in that sense, um, there is the, there is an enchantment. People ve because we're made in God's image, I think people find it very hard to close the door on this idea of transcendence. But you're right, the, 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 the question is right, that we look for it in very different places than we used to in terms of what might call, be called traditional religion. And in that sense, I don't really like the term religion because I think that is a more modernistic understanding of um, human beings. I think the second thing I, I'd note was uh, the point about, what was the first, um, the first point, the first question again about- The first um, one was, was about organized religion. Yeah, yeah, so I think, yes. I mean, in terms of stats, maybe organized religion, but the point I'm making, this is one of the, the, these magnetic points in this book is that we still like to be connected to something. Organization in that sense is still important as human beings. Again, because we're communal, we're made to be communal, not isolated kind of um, isolated, like um, isolated beings, but we're built for community and that always shows itself. So it might not be organized religion, but the idea of community, I think, is important. And that's where the church is so important. You know, the church is meant to be the place that shows what this side of the new heaven and the new earth, what community should be like in terms of unity, diversity, uh, love. It's back to Schaefer's, Francis Schaefer, you know, uh, the, the, our, our love for each other is the ultimate apologetic. Um, and when I say that to people, they say, oh, what my church doesn't show that. But that's that. But that's the importance of being together look people who are people in society who are rootless dislocated they want community if they look at the church and the church is just doing all the things that the world does gossiping backbiting not loving each other why would they want to come into that community but where they see a loving com community sometimes yeah where there is rebuke where there is kind of discipline in that sense but they see people loving each other looking out for each other uh, people who are very different from themselves that that's a that's an amazing um, uh, uh, apologetic. So if if the church was just being the church, that would have an amazing transformative um, uh, um, kind of impact in society. Yes, I, I will. I will also highlight on the fact of the of the church uh, matter that it was raised about the spirituality and the church. This is very interesting because we we think that we've seen so uh, some people that uh, have opted out, you know, of the church and just keep on with these uh, Zoom meetings and having the preaching on the YouTube and things like that. But this is only highlighted what it was already in the postmodernism. And that is that we have become co um, uh, customers. Uh, we, 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 we tend uh, to think about religion in terms of, you know, even Christianity, of, of them of buying things. And so we choose this and the other. And it's very interesting coming back to what I was saying about how you see here in Spain, how the, the right-wing people will choose some things from the Roman Catholic Church that they like, uh, some parts of the teachings, and the left-wing will emphasize other parts of the teaching. But none of them is realizing that uh, in order to be a Roman Catholic country, in this case, in this example, you need to embrace both things. So the, the, the calling that we are uh, we have as, a, as evangelicals is as, as, as span God's word and see that is the whole goes together, that uh, to be a spiritual you have to attend a, a physical church <laughs> you need to be found in a within the domains of the of the of the church that you need to meet with other people that worship uh, the lord jesus christ as well so we need to realize this is not something that you choose uh, a package you know you you go to the supermarket you choose your own products no no you have to accept the whole you have to realize as Dan was also mentioning in another context at the beginning, that uh, we are disciples of Jesus Christ. Very important yeah. to emphasize 
in these days, discipleship, uh, yeah. make them yeah. realize the whole. It is integral. Uh, it is something that goes together. And that is the, the calling that we have at the present time. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus in the high priestly prayer in John 17, he only prays for people who believe in me through their message. Who are the they? It's the apostles. Mm -hmm. So the apostolic Jesus is the only Jesus. And it's that Jesus that we we hear about as we come together under God's word, uh, as we meet with one another, uh, as uh, it's not good to break out of the habit of meeting together, as Hebrews tells us. Um, and so it's it, it's essential that those means of grace as as the church gathers, I, I liken it to the fact that every week we're in the world and the world is so bewildering that our compass is spinning round. And every week we come to the gathering and we are uh, the, our compass is set right or it's like a medical field tent. We come in and we, we need to be fed. We need to be bandaged up to be sent out into our callings in the world, the church scattered. And that that's essential. Um, in terms of being together and even like learning how to engage culture together, not just as individuals, but as Christians in a community. Um, that's that's the centrality of of the local church. OK, we've got one quick question that uh, Martin's going to put that Vivian's put in just to wrap things up. Uh, so the question is from, from Vivian. Um, what's the most difficult question you've ever had to find an answer to? I think give you 10 seconds each to, to answer this. Oh, wow. <laughs> Daniel, you can answer too. Oh, yeah. Pepe, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the difficult questions when people get actually to, to answer them has to do with, uh, with uh, the destiny of people who die. I think uh, at least my experience has to do with that. And, and of course, it, it needs time for people to articulate that. It's not so easy to... to for people to put it like that but when when you need to 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 answer this kind of question i think it's, it's a great difficulty because we, we there's a number of issues there to be tackled and how we do it and of course i i won't i won't go without giving you an answer and say well we are in in the lord's hands and the lord knows best uh, but the bible clearly teaches there are two places uh, yeah uh, heaven and earth um, a new heaven and new, new earth and and hell but the Lord um, is uh, is in control of everything. So we need to to be able to answer in a biblical way, uh, with uh, the strength that uh, the Lord provides for us in His own word, and also what we find uh, so helpful in other ways of approaching. For instance, uh, it was mentioned already, C.S. Lewis. Uh, I think the way he approaches these matters of ultimate questions is is just wonderful. No? The, the, this book about uh, heaven and earth of uh, C.S. Lewis, this uh, book I recommend very much. And then, of course, at the same time, and then we go back to what, how we started, we need to do it with gentleness and respect. Uh, this kind of question, we need, we need to realize when people put to us questions, is as important as it is to answer, is also the manner and the way we we treat people as we answer them and this is so vital to remember in this yeah. my um, my kind of cheeky answer is to say that actually when someone asks a question it's great that they're even engaging the fact is we're struggling to get traction again in terms of where normal people are for them to engage at all now if they are engaging i do i do think this issue that we've i think we've talked about it a lot on this call pepe has and i have this idea of identity that People are brought up to believe that, you know, they're the masters of their own destiny, that this self-determination and I can, you know, I, I, it all rests in me. So to be able to talk about authority, that we are created, that we are not our own, that our bodies are not our own, to be able to communicate that in the 21st century, I think is very hard. I think we need to do it. It's essential. But to, to persuade people of our createdness and that there is a creator um, and that they, they have claims on our life. I think that's very hard in a culture that is can be very suspicious. I mean, I just find it really interesting. And again, this great Pepe's on the call because I say that, but then of course Pepe's saying, well, lots of people are, are wanting to go back to Catholic teaching because there does seem to be, for some people, they see that as being a, an authority or a certainty. So people are looking for these certainties, looking for it in the wrong places. Um, but even in, in, in a very individualized culture, it's interesting that there is still this trend that we need to come back to some certainties, which sadly some people think the Roman Catholic Church is, 
Uh, but that for me shows that there is this inner kind of understanding that we we're not good at um, defining ourselves. We need to be defined. And that's, of course, we have a wonderful message to say about that. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, Dan has reminded me when I, this conference I mentioned in, in Catalonia, I really, I really found it very, very hard to to when the the people say, "Are you what you are saying? You are you are telling them to be single uh, for all their lives," uh, uh, and that's that's so hard to 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 answer that in a in a Christian way. I, I just found I I found very very complicated to to answer not in terms of what the Bible teaches, but in terms, as I was trying to convey, how you you bring some sympathy or understanding that yeah. you are not just clinical and you are not just seeing uh, this from an angle in which you, you have an advantage over those people who are struggling with, with this kind of uh, sexual yeah. uh, inclination, um, uh, what is happening in, in their lives. So this is the kind of question. So I will emphasize again, that we really do need to work in ourselves so that when at least when we give an answer as 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 uh, he said of francis schaefer that uh, when he was asked about hell um they didn't say much i uh, would just see a, a tear in his eye you know? yeah and i think we 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 live in days in which we we need to find tears in our eyes we want yeah. to be effective Definitely, definitely. Gentleness and respect. That's the that's that's back to that one Peter passage. Great. OK, we uh, we were going to break into groups, but uh, time has beaten us. So uh, but we do want to just pray briefly. So uh, I'm going to pray and then there'll be an open chance for two or three people to pray. So you'll have to jump in quick and then Phil will close uh, and that will be the end of the call. So uh, let's just spend a few minutes praying. Father in heaven, uh, we come before you now and are thankful for what we've been thinking about, but it's just pressed upon us again, the uh, the great needs that there are around us, the enormity of the task, uh, how ill-equipped we feel, but also, Lord, it's reminded us that we have a great God and a great gospel. And so that's why we come to you now to pray, uh, to call upon you uh, to help us, to be bold, to be wise, to speak with gentleness and respect, to speak lovingly and to live for our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we plead with you to work mightily uh, wherever we are located and based, that people might hear the truth and come to faith. So hear our prayers now as we come in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will give us big hearts of love and hearts of prayer so that we will be ready to uh, speak to anyone who might ask us questions about what we believe. But Lord, especially for those who are nearest and dearest to us, we pray, Lord God, for a gentle and intelligent answer. Lord, that you will help us and speak through us and we pray that, Lord, we might have loving churches where we are true families, showing the great love of our Lord Jesus Christ to one another. And Lord God, we pray that you will bring in to our churches and among us those who really need the gospel. And Lord God, that we might, our churches might be places where the gospel is so loved and people are, people's lives are so changed. Oh, Lord God, please come upon us and bless us and revive us, we ask, for Jesus' sake. Amen. 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 Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight, Lord. Thank you for the conversations. Thank you for all the things that have been said. We thank you for Dan and we thank you for, uh, for Pepe as well, Lord. And we pray for them, Lord, as they continue in their work, Lord, Dan and all that he does. And pray father that you continue to bless him and with the understanding and and, and uh, that his ministry would be very fruitful lord god and, and assistance to the church and for pepe lord in his situation there uh, in spain in, in the center of spain uh, in that catholic uh, area lord god i do pray that you help 
uh, Pepe and the church there to, to be great uh, witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with them, we pray. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Our Father, time and time again, we've gone back to that wonderful verse this evening. 1 Peter 3, 15. It's so relevant for us. Thank you for how our brothers have stimulated us this evening and encouraged us. We are so aware, our Father, there are so many questions, so many challenges that we need to deal with, that we need to be equipped for. And yet, Father, when we think of 1 Peter 3, 15, we think of the words that come just before it. It surely is the key to everything that we must sanctify our hearts in Christ Jesus. And so, Father, we pray for ourselves that there might be a, an ongoing, uh, intimate walk with you, O God, that uh, we might walk in this world as, as Jesus did, that we might see people as, as he does, that we might feel for them as he does, and that we might speak to them in the way that the Lord Jesus did. So, Father, we do pray for holiness of life, and, and we pray for progressive sanctification in our lives, Lord, as the whole basis for, for looking out at the world around us and for loving our neighbours and truly being able to give an answer for the hope that is within us. Thank you, Father, for the encouragement of this evening. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You're muted, Phil. Father, thank you for this short time that we've been able to have together this evening. Uh, we want to thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you for that great saviour of sinners. Thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for that great calling you've given us uh, to take the good news to those around us who need to hear it. Please, would you continue your work of grace within us and enable us to be more faithful and more fervent in what we seek to do in sharing the gospel. So help us, we pray, for Jesus' sake and his glory. Amen. 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 Well, time has definitely flown by this evening. Um, I know I find it incredibly helpful, uh, and I hope that you have too. Thank you again both for joining us and for staying with us. Uh, please don't forget our next webinar. Monday evening, 7th February, 7.30 UK time. We'd love to see you there again. Well, that's it for now. Good night, God bless, and happy Christmas.